Okay, so uh, today is the uh, 28th of, uh, of January uh, 2022, and we'll talk about, um, we'll begin uh, talking about the Carolingian architecture. Why? Because uh, Charmaine, uh, who, 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 whose name uh, uh, is connected with, uh, with uh, what Carolingian means, because it's Carol there, and he was also known as Charles Carol. Um, died on the 28th of January. And after that, we'll talk about a uh, uh, very important uh, modern painter, uh, Jackson Pollock, who was born uh, on, on, on this day, uh, the 28th of, of January. So let's, uh, let's read a little bit about Charmant. This is a representation of him, um, maybe not a very flattering one or a, a very um, you know, uh, good representation of him, I don't know. Anyway, let's read a little bit. Charmagne, in Latin, Carolus Magnus, the great Carol, uh, Charles the Great, was king of the Franks from 768, king of the Lombards from 17, 7, 7, 7, 74, and emperor of the Romans from 800. During the early Middle Ages, Charlemagne united the majority of Western and Central Europe. Uh, he was the first recognized emperor to rule from Western Europe since the fall of the Western Roman Empire around three centuries earlier. The expanded Frankish state that Charlemagne founded is known as the Carolingian Empire. He was later canonized by uh, anti-Pope Pascal III, and is regarded as beatified, beautified, which is a step on the path to sainthood by the mainstream Catholic Church. Now, to call his, this period early Middle Ages, um, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, I mean, it's very early because it's before the Romanesque, but, uh, you know, this text is from uh, Wikipedia. Carolingian architecture is the style of North European pre-Romanesque architecture belonging to the period of the Carolingian Renaissance of the late 8th and 9th centuries when the Carolingian dynasty dominated West European politics. It was a conscious attempt to emulate Roman architecture and to that end it borrowed heavily from early Christian and Byzantine architecture, though um, there, were, there are nonetheless innovations of its own resulting in a unique uh, character. So the Carolingian, uh, uh, the Carolingian uh, period, uh, Renaissance, generated such a construction boom that between 768 and 855, 27 new cathedrals, 417 monastic buildings and 100 royal residences were built. Just during Charlemagne's reign, uh, 16 cathedrals, 232 monasteries and 65 palaces were built. Well, you know, let's hope these numbers are accurate. The kings were not only responsible, kings with a plural, because it wasn't just Charlemagne, but he, is, he was the central force there. The kings were not only responsible for the construction sites, but they also provided the architects and the funding. The rediscovery of the architecture treatises written by Vitruvius enabled the building in stone, a material little used until then north of the Loire Valley. During their travels to Italy, the Carolingians discovered the Roman basilicas the triumphal arches and the Palatine chapels. The architects did not simply copy the Roman forms, but rather adapted their plans to serve the needs of the royal and religious ceremonies. Most of the architectural elements invented at the beginning of the Carolingian period were refined over decades and success successively adapted to eventually lead to the Romanesque architecture of the 11th century. Uh, so uh, it was a, a prolific time and we'll see the buildings were admirable. 
Now we begin with this this uh, this place, uh, this uh, city, Lorch, or town. I don't know what it is. Well, city, I guess, the Carolingian city, famed for its culture and arts. Uh, there are buildings that exist there that were built at that time in the eighth and ninth, ninth century, Lorch. Uh, and this is one of them. And I, I love this architecture. You know, it's, uh, yes, it's heavy. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's an architecture you can trust. If you compare these worlds with our worlds, you know, uh, thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. This is an architecture from a different time. Uh, an architecture springing from the earth and willing to last. Uh, Lord's Abbey, the gateway from um, around 800, the, the, the year 800. So, you know, uh, this is an architecture from 1,200 years or so. And uh, look at this, you know, it's, uh, it's sophisticated. It has, uh, you know, ornamentation and, uh, you know, it's, it's rich, it's coherent and it stands. How many buildings of uh, the ones we build today will last for 1,200 years? I think none. <laughs> Sorry for my excessive optimism. Uh, so uh, this is from 1,200 years ago. Isn't it also capable of uh, you know uh, being liked by us? I think it is capable. I, I, I think it's nothing wrong with this. Uh, with this building. Uh, of course, it was refurbished, it was cleaned, uh, so who knows certain things, the roof, I'm sure was redone, but still, uh, the main body is from that time. Here is a, you know, a graphic representation of it. And it has, uh, it's almost something uh, suave about it, you know, it's, yes, it's an architecture uh, built under an emperor, but, um, it seems like a sensitive architecture. It's not brutal. Uh, there is an attempt towards, um, you know, uh, sensitivity here. Now the church of this abbey in the same place, Lorch, which we already saw a picture of, sorry about the alarm is spread all over the picture. Um, <laughs> I love this church. I love those fortress-like walls. Um, what can I say? Nothing wrong with it. You know, it's it's uh, it's um, it's a building which um, fills me with emotion because it is a building erected from the earth and uh, not saying no to gravity. You know. Most architecture today that stirs up our imagination or interest as employs uh, cantilevers, you know, cantilever parts. They didn't need at that time something like this. And is this building less emotional uh, or uh, expressing emotion or architectural interest than our audacious, uh, you know, attempts to leave the earth? This building doesn't need to leave the earth. It loves the earth, it grows from the earth. Why is it we cannot be like this any longer, you know? And the only thing we can do is to, you know, do some acrobatics through some kind of engineering, you know, uh, to cantilever architecture as much as we can, you know, because we hate the earth. That's the truth, we hate it and we try to escape it. We try to escape gravity, why? This building doesn't try to, quite the opposite. It shows a clear determination to embrace gravity, to welcome gravity. But there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, this building is telling Elon Musk, don't go to, to Mars, sir. Stay here on the earth. Invest your huge fortunes here on the earth. Clean it up, build beautifully. You don't need to go to the moon or to Mars. Stay here, look at the beautiful trees, look at the beautiful grass, look at the beautiful stone, build here, live here. Why are all these people trying to escape Earth? The founder of eBay wants to leave the Earth. The founder of Amazon wants to leave Earth. Elon Musk wants to leave Earth, why? 
I think we should ask this question, why? After all, the earth was quite generous with them, was it, was it not? I mean, maybe there are some people who have reasons to want to leave the earth. Those underprivileged who almost have nothing to eat and maybe even without almost, those I would understand, but how do you explain that billionaires want to leave the earth? Which is an expression of disliking the earth because no one wants to leave what one likes. It's a beautiful church. Another building, sorry for about the German, uh, you know, look at this, you know, okay, maybe we are too cynical to appreciate uh, this kind of uh, so-called naive uh, building, but uh, I'm not, I'm not so cynical, I like it, I appreciate it. And I know that each stone there placed in the wall was done with effort by human hands, just like mine or yours. And, uh, you know, I, I think we should appreciate them as such. Lords, from uh, 1,200 years ago, there are, as you can see, even uh, gestures towards, um, you know, culminating the column with the you know, uh, embellished and uh, you know, more uh, refined uh, capital. And this, uh, this uh, ornamentation again shows uh, uh, an obvious concern for what we call beauty. Now the Benedictine convent of St. John and Muster, 1800s, um, it, there are just some, it's not very clear to me what which part was, was from 1,200 years ago. Maybe, maybe the Campanile, I don't know, or maybe the building, I, I, they seem to be good measure, rather, you know, either well kept or, or new. It's hard to know exactly, but something here was built at that time. And uh, you look at the incredible mountains behind and, uh, you know, the setting is inviting uh, some uh, respect, if not affection. Inside there is, uh, there are frescoes, which are, yes, they are not uh, painted or designed with the skill, the so-called skill of the Renaissance, but in some way, I am more impressed by this, you know, this so-called naivete. Um, and look at this interior, it's, it's, it's moving. It's moving uh, with its age and not just with the, the, its age, but also with the, you know, a patina of time is important, but it's important also the, uh, I'm not an expert and I don't have many images with, with the, the artworks. But why did they make artworks 1,200 years ago? Because, uh, you know, you cannot divorce architecture from narration. Uh, but uh, even without uh, pictorial representations, the building is uh, impressive. Now the Palatine Chapel in Aachen. This is huge. Uh, look at this. This is, a, this is an architecture that we ignore. We don't even know it exists. But look at this, you know, it's, it's what is here is from 1,200 years ago. It is incredible. Is this inferior to the Renaissance architecture? I don't think it is. Really, I don't think it is. It's almost, I, I, I even see a certain modernity here because of the hybridity, you know, with various buildings, you know, and connected and bridges, and it's very, very interesting. And it's certainly monumental. When was it built? Hey, look, 1,200 years ago, the Palatine Chapel in Aachen. Hey, look at the, you know, the embroidered, uh, you know, facade, I mean, there are sophisticated things going on here and uh, 
we think we invented the wheel. No, we didn't invent the wheel. It was invented a long time ago, even before the, the you know, the Carolingians. Look at the interior. Uh, it's, it's moving, look at this. You know, this is not a primitive architecture. This is a very sophisticated architecture, knowledgeable architecture built by humans, just like we consider ourselves to be. Although I'm beginning to have some doubts about that. We see the octagon, the octagon about which uh, I, 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 I had the, the lack of inspiration to talk about some weeks ago, and not too many people were interested about this, of course. Why should we be interested about the of the octagon which fascinated Leonardo da Vinci. Now, such minor matters do not interest us. I think it's beautiful. What I look at is beautiful. Uh, uh, sorry for the exalted uh, word. Charman, the first European who died on the 28th of uh, January. So we see you know, three plants here. On the right is the Palatine Chapel from Aachen. Then in the middle, the Basilica of San Vitale in Ravenna from three, 250 years earlier. And then you know, about the, the same time, even earlier, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem from um, Three hundred twenty-five, then five hundred forty-seven, and eight hundred four. The years when they were well, the the first one was begun at that time. But it's interesting to compare the the, the plants. You see, it was the round. I mean, these were all churches. They were all Christian buildings, but it was the roundness of the building. It was not a here. Yes, there is a an attempt at some, uh, you know, uh, linear or longitudinal uh, development, but still the main space was, was round, was circular, that, that it was used an octagon or a circle. But in essence, this is a Dravena is the octagon. Here we have the octagon again. Uh, and, uh, but the roundness itself is a different kind it's almost like a different kind of Christianity. It's a Christianity of, of uh, proclaiming being together, coming together in a circle, not with a, you know, uh, a, a person on a pedestal uh, at the end of a, I mean, it was, it was a different con spatial conception. And I think was e even a different understanding of, of how worship was to take place. I, f I find uh, very valuable these beginnings. Well, uh, the beginnings were even earlier, but this roundness of the space, which is so uh, auspicious also for education. Uh, a few days ago, there was a, a good article in uh, an Arch Daily about uh, elliptical spaces uh, in, uh, in education, buildings, buildings with either, you know, circular, uh, um, circular space or uh, elliptical, you know, based on an ellipse, but all about actually some kind of a roundness, the roundness of education. And I, I think that that, uh, that the roundness of education connects with what uh, Louis Kahn uh, thought the first school was like. He's, he asked himself, Louis Kahn, how was the first school? And he said, it was probably an old man under a tree with a, a, a group of young people around him in a circle. 
and he was telling the, them about his experience in life, his knowledge and so on. That was probably the first school, an old man under a tree with uh, people in a circle around him. And maybe that's how the first uh, church was built too, in the same spirit. One thousand two hundred years ago, they knew how to build. I mean, we look at some drawings now here on our, uh, you know, screens. But but these were built with stones by people like you and me, and without a sophisticated technology. And yet, you saw very impressive, very very big buildings. I mean, you know, uh, this building, and look, I, I, I truly feel that this kind of arrangement with the chairs in a circle, this uh, equidistance from a center where there is no one except the idea of God has a different uh, effect on the psychology of the, of the participants, you know? Uh, the big unknown, the infinity or the, the absolute or God, you know, can we represent him? Uh, maybe not. Maybe yes. I don't know. It depends. We choose. But, but this, this sitting in a circle, I think, is conducive with, towards a different relationship between people as opposed to even classrooms in a school. If the, if the students, the, the pupils will, would sit like this, uh, it, you belong to a community, you belong to a family, instead of looking at the back of the student in front of you, you know, like, like in an airplane. Even in an airplane, I thought it would be nice if you had to diminish the fear of flying, if at least in some portions of the plane, you turn the some, you know, every two rows of, of chairs, you turn the, the seats around, so people can face each other instead of facing the, you know, the back of a person in front of you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's that's what I feel. But what do I know about um, uh, flying? The oratory in Germany, the uh, Germany de Pre from 1806. Another, in my, uh, in my opinion, impressive building. Uh, and impressive without the need for, uh, you know, uh, cantilever parts or all the rest. Now, this is a building which sits on the earth properly, is not ashamed of being uh, conditioned by gravity, by the force of gravity. No. And there's nothing wrong with that. And why is it we don't believe in, in, in this sort of thing? Why? It might be, maybe I'm not totally wrong when I say that we hate the earth and we try to escape it because those, look, look at this interior. Uh, is anything wrong with it? I don't think so. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a building you can trust. You can trust because it is serious, it is grave, it is solid, and um, it is truthful. It tells you how it was erected, how it was built. You understand it. Of course, people lied in, at that time too. You know, lies, I'm sure, are not only, only ours. People, uh, people lied then too, and they lied uh, since the beginning of humankind. But, but the building, doesn't lie. This sort of building, in my opinion, doesn't lie too much. I think our buildings lie a lot because we can. That's why we can do it through all kinds of mechanisms and finishes, so-called finishes. And, uh, you know, uh, did you think about the fact that uh, in very old architecture, for example, where you had the wall, you know, become often, you know, rather ornamental towards the outside, but in the thickness of the world, there was nothing, just the, just the material, you know, call it brick or call it stone, 
But today we have these sandwiched, you know, walls where inside the wall <clears throat> there is an incredible complexity in order to make the wall very, very thin, thinner and thinner and thinner. But towards out, towards outside is just white, a blank white wall, and nothing inside. I mean, no, no, a blank white wall. While inside there is uh, the complexity, the technological, the techno complexity of uh, of the sandwich. But but at that time, when when they build these walls, you know. There was nothing inside, no uh, isolation, no uh, uh, nothing of the sophisticated materials. It's just just matter, you know. And yes, we cannot be like this a lot because you know uh, it's limited stone in the world, or uh, you know. But I don't know. I mean, I think our our excessive technologization of architecture. Um, created uh, paradoxically uh, a very simplistic architecture towards the outside and a very complex architecture towards the, the, towards the inside of the wall. I'm not talking about the, the inside of the interior space. I'm talking about the thickness of the wall. Here, the thickness of the wall is totally irrelevant. It's, it's just one matter, one material, stone or wood. Imperial Palace, Ingelheim, completed after 1814. Here there are just, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, to know exactly. There are some remnants. Uh, you can see it, it, that these are fragments, but they are scattered. And uh, there was the effort of the archeologists to you know, imagine how the building was. It's like the Roman Forum, except that this is from 800 years later or so. The Carolingian period. Uh, yeah. Now maybe here in this representation, we have some uh, of that uh, very fashionable uh, these days, uh, metaverse. You know where we try to compensate the the absence uh, through virtual means. Um, yes, perhaps it's an interesting uh, enterprise. And these walls are from that time, but uh, you know these columns are new, and uh, oh, many of these things are rebuilt. But these walls are from that time. 1,200 years ago, when people like uh, us try to live on this earth. And look at the blue sky and the look at the green, uh, green uh, grass. And uh, tell me if, if our world is not beautiful. I think it is beautiful. It's just that uh, we created too much garbage in the world with our uh, unending consume, you know? Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola, you name it. You go into, I mean, there was never so much abundance in the world. It's clear. I mean, you go to any supermarket and, uh, you know, you are overwhelmed by the incredible multitude of so many, 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 many things of everything. And yet we are unhappy, <laughs> you know. Now, uh, another Abbey from 1815. Um, Sometimes I wish I was a monk, you know. Uh, maybe there is still some, some time left, uh, not too much to, to become a monk, maybe. Uh, and look at this interior. Now, uh, really, you know, you can take the best building by uh, Zaha Hadid. And yes, uh, here you don't have that, um, you know, spiraling uh, vortex, you don't. But in its simplicity, this, this interior totally um, seduces me. I love it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the stone, it's the, the articulation of pieces of stone. It's, it, 
I think it's plenty. You know, I would gladly spend hours there on the bench, on a very, maybe not very comfortable bench and not get tired. Of, because it's very reassuring, this building. It, it is telling you, don't fear, I am with you, I'm here, I will protect you. I was built to protect you and uh, God is with you. And through me, the building. I love this building. Old, old walls, of course. But I love the old, and I love these thick, heavy old walls. You know, one would call them primitive. I don't know. For me, they are not primitive. They are very sensitive, and I can connect with them. And the grass, I just uh, said at the beginning that for me, a blade of grass is I know I am uh, saying it in a provocative way, but uh, I think there is a little bit of truth in what I said that a blade of grass is um, uh, more important than the Parthenon because it is alive. That's why the grass, the blade of grass, the very modest, the humble blade of grass, just one blade of grass is alive. It grows towards light, and the Parthenon doesn't grow towards light nor does uh, the most sophisticated uh, gadget made by Apple. They don't grow towards light. In fact, if you remove the battery and if you don't charge them electrically, they are dead. While a blade of grass is not dead. Just like a small insect. They are not dead, they are alive. Unless, of course, we crush them under our you know, criminal soul. Look at these beautiful walls. How they say hello to us from 1,200 years ago. Sorry about my voice. Église de Saint Saint Philibert de, de Grand Lieu. Um, now another abbey in Belgium, 1819-1823. Look at this. This is the architecture that we prefer not to talk about because it's it was built. Uh, you know, uh, some uh, 500 years before the Renaissance, if not 600. Before the Renaissance began. The interior, of course, it was refurbished. It's new. It, it was, but uh, towards the outside, we see the building as probably they saw it at uh, the, the time when it was built. Unadorned but uh, still impressive. Carolingian, the Carolingian architecture, St. Michael in Fulda, Rotunda and Crypt. You know, I wonder, uh, there is the prospect of a war now, no? Between Russia and Ukraine. To me, it is unbelievable. You know, if you look at these buildings and you contemplate the human history and the human suffering and the human longing for, you know, essentially for peace, for harmony, for, uh, you know, living on this earth as much as, as possible, and, and still at the frontier of Ukraine now, there are more than 100,000 soldiers ready to provoke death. 
To me, it is incredible, you know? And they are pushed there by a president who claims he's Christian, who claims he is an Orthodox, who claims he is a believer in God. How could you uh, be a believer in God and get ready now to provoke him and suffering? How? I don't understand. Am I in a mad mod, uh, mad uh, world? Yes, I am. This is a mad world. We have uh, atomic bombs. We have nuclear arsenals. They could ravage the earth. It could transform it into dust. These are people who go to museums, who read books, apparently, who go to, went to school, who they, they go to the Pope, they embrace the Pope, they go to the church, they embrace the patriarch, they fall on their knees, they pray to God, but they have no problem to start wars. I don't understand my world and I don't understand these people. I re it's impossible for me to understand. If Russia, I mean, I don't understand the president of Russia doesn't care at all about the will of the Ukrainians. They decided to break away from the empire. Let them be. It's clear they don't want you. So then why do you force them? By provoking death. Maybe lots of deaths. It's, 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 it seems the old story is ours again. You know, wars will continue to be because of the foolishness and the ambition and the vanity of all kinds of unworthy leaders. How else could I put it? You know, it's all about power and power and power when the smallest blade of grass is much more wise than the president of, of, of Russia. But he doesn't listen to, he inflates his, uh, you know, chest and uh, poses uh, without a shirt to show his uh, eternal use and his, his eternal uh, strength. It's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> you know, but it's useless that I, I have this outburst, you know. We are ready to start a war again. Didn't we have the Second World War? Didn't we have uh, 20 years ago the war in Iraq where one million people died? One million people died. And we still learn nothing. And why did those one million people die? Because of oil. That's why. Maybe that's why Elon Musk wants to go to Mars or the, to Moon. Maybe, although he is himself uh, not a stranger to the quest for uh, power and more power and more power. Another basilica from Steinbach, 1827. Um, You'll see also a little bit later uh, uh, my favorite building from the from the Carolingian period, but this is also beautiful. I, I mean, you know, this interior uh, just as it is, without any kind of improvement, so to speak, I think is very very moving. I would sit on this chair probably here in the sunlight, you know, for for hours and days and weeks and months and not get bored, contemplating just, just this interior, very unadorned, very simple, eroded by time, but I think its, it's authenticity is uh, enough for the spirit. Very, very nice. And these spaces are even nicer when there are no chairs. Well, there are these chairs near the window, but the, you know, the space is not filled with them like in a, you know, so-called uh, normal uh, functioning uh, uh, church. Very nice, from 1,200 years ago. Another church in Frankfurt. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, the big city, Frankfurt. Uh, I see Frankfurt Höchst. I don't know what that is. 
Well, you see a big, uh, big church built uh, 1,200 years ago. That's, uh, you know, five, 600 years before the Renaissance began. And uh, 300 years before the Gothic uh, buildings uh, began to um, show up. So we talked today about Carolingian architecture because on the 28th of January, Charmagne died. Um, I forgot exactly what year, in 18 something. And, you know, Charmagne was considered the first European. He brought together many parts of Europe. And uh, yes, through conquering, he himself was a, was a war warrior. He was a king, but... Uh, yeah, I guess it's unavoidable in human affairs to divorce uh, even splendid achievements from some suffering, probably suffering at the large scale. A castle uh, in Germany, 18, uh, from, 18, uh, from eight, 884, yeah, um, some parts are new here, but uh, still, you see a lot, lot a lot of roundness, you know, and this roundness to me is telling me something about the, the, you know, the, the face at that time. It, it was plus the imperfections. We are lucky to have in Romania plenty of, uh, you know, uh, fortress uh, churches or, uh, you know, the, the fortified uh, churches of, in Transylvania which are, um, in my opinion, impressive. And they, 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 they represent a, a, great, uh, a great treasure. And there, this kind of roundness is, is present as well. They are small citadels. And what is nice about them is that, yes, they are uh, you know, religious buildings, but there is also a secular uh, function added to them. And by the way, of this, uh, the, the University of Architecture and Urbanism, Ion Minku in Bucharest, has in its administration for uh, I don't know how many years one of these beautiful uh, fortified uh, churches in Transylvania, and, uh, at uh, Dealu Frumos, where actually you know activities related to architecture can take place and do take place sometimes. Rurality is always nice. I, 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 I think uh, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the future of urbanism, about urbanism, but what about ruralism? Yeah, I, I, if it was uh, up to me, I would even start a school of ruralism, you know, or in opposition to urbanism. Let's, let's, let's uh, study the village. Let's study rurality. Let's think about uh, ways to, to, to uh, sensitively uh, address the issues of, uh, of, of the rural areas all over the world, you know, uh, because it would be a very sustainable activity to do that, to do so. But we are still obsessed by urbanism. It's true that uh, the large population of the world is a reality that we have to handle as well. It's true. But uh, when I think of China, for example, China is building now uh, huge cities overnight. We know it. But China also has a multitude, I mean, a large, a huge multitude of very old villages. And actually, those villages in China are an incredible richness. I, uh, some voices in China uh, are, are promoting uh, the the... the the interest of the government to, to be oriented towards those villages. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of villages. I have a beautiful book published in Germany in the 1920s about uh, China, uh, Baukus und Landschaft, um, you know, landscape and architecture, where I saw incredible beauty 
on many pages about those very old villages. I think the very old villages and the, the old, the newer villages, I, I, I think the future belongs to the village, not to the city. But how to marry the village with a big population and the increasing population of the world, that is of course an issue to address, probably a not, not an easy matter to resolve. But I still think the village is the future for the moment, at least, not the city. The city is a great, uh, you know, uh, product of, of human activity, but it's also the the great product of uh, great pollution and other problems. While the village still has, you know, its its roots in in nature, and we need nature badly. So perhaps it's time to move our attention towards the village and less towards the city. Maybe I am naive or uh, I don't think in uh, appropriate terms. I don't know, but uh, Abbey of Corby, eight, eight, 885. Look at this, you know, is it all? Yes, it is. This building could have well been, uh, you know, present, would have been present in a city. And maybe it is, I don't know what this Corby is. It's an abbey from 885, but quite, uh, I, I, I wrote somewhere not too long ago that um, an abbey, perhaps a monastery should be, should not be, um, you know, mag should not be triumphant, but uh, this building is triumphant. I mean, you know, it, it has the size of a building of the present. How did they build it? They did. No more roundness here. Uh, I mean, it's already towards the end of the of the of, of the ninth century, but it is an impressive building. Uh, it is. I'm talking about this, not so much about this. This is. Uh, probably newer, but this one is, uh, austere, of course, but the life of the spirit should be austere. Another church. From the Carolingian period. The Carolingian period refers not only to the, to the, to the specific years when Carol the Great or Charlemagne lived, but also, you know, a certain number of years after he died. So it's a, it's a longer period than his actual uh, lifespan. But still, uh, in architecture, this period is, is called the Carolingian uh, period or the Carolingian architecture, borrowing the name from him, from Carol. The Church of Santa Maria del Naranco, uh, St. Mary of Mount Naranco, is a Roman Catholic pre-Romanesque church on the slope of Mount Naranco, only three kilometers from Oviedo in Asturias, northern Spain. I love this building. I really do. Maybe it is not used. It's true. I like ruins. Uh, I'm a romantic spirit, but I, I love this building. You know, it's uh, it's testifying about the the longing of man for God in its silent way. Again, maybe it's not used at all any longer, but uh, what a presence. Those, these stones, one placed one above the other, and look at the interior. Is it impressive? I think it is impressive. Are there, uh, you know, parapets, um, you know, added, uh, associated with, uh, you know, added to the stairs? No. Are these uh, stairs rather, you know, questionable from Neufert's point of view? Yes, they are. But 
but it doesn't matter. You see, even, you know, I actually have in my own house, in my own apartment, I have, uh, because I have some, lots of books and lots of packages with books and so on. And I have some spaces which are not wider than um, 50 centimeters. Like here, you know, maybe this is about 50 centimeters in, you know, the length. And, and yet it works. But if, if you do this in a plan, or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you would be considered uh, inadequate. The truth is life is much more uh, flexible, actually, than our little diagrams, you know, functionalist, where we want to have always the corridor one meter, 20 centimeters wide, and all the doors are about the same width, you know. It's not like this, you know, you could have, like, for example, in the house where I live in Sibiu, um, it's a very old uh, house uh, with an entrance from uh, the 16th century, and the and the the door the door doorway is just about one meter, uh, maybe 60, cent 60 70 centimeters tall. The opening uh, towards the street, and yes, if you are not careful, you can hit your head uh, because you know if you are one meter and eighty centimeters tall. Uh, in fact, I did hit once my head dramatically. It's okay. Well, what I'm trying to say is all these dimensions that uh, we consider optimal and so on. Uh, yeah, yeah, from a rationalistic point of view. But again, this this stair is doing the job and is did the job for one thousand, uh, almost one thousand two hundred years. And it's done in a way which would be condemned by uh, most, uh, you know, standards of so-called, you know, optimal uh, being or optimal uh, functioning or whatever. And look at these, uh, you know, narrative, decorative elements incorporated into the stone. I don't know what they represent. Maybe it's not difficult to find out or even to imagine. But aren't they a testimony about the, you know, the feelings, the thoughts of people who preceded us 1,200 years ago? People just like us, you know, with aspirations, with fear of death, with hunger sometimes, with joys, with sorrows, just like us. And this building is, uh, you know, enduring for such a long time. Well, this is a plan, of course, drawn uh, in our time. A very simple building, you know, two stairs, you know, symmetrically placed outside. And then, uh, you know, it is what it is. Just, just as education is what you remain with after you forgot everything you learned, maybe architecture is what you remain with after all that is not truly really necessary disappeared. Because here we see, you know, again, I have an issue today with the parapets, with the handrails. Where are they? Maybe they were once, I don't know, or maybe not, maybe, Maybe they were always like this. I have no idea. But the building could function even like this with a little bit of, okay, call it danger, but it's still, it's reduced to essentials. And it, I think it still works. Uh, how tall do you think this uh, opening in the wall is? It's certainly smaller than uh, one meter and a half. I mean, look how many steps, you know, five steps. Well, how, how tall is one? This is a very, and still you can go through it. Yeah, you can go through it, lowering your body a little bit. It's okay. You know, the presumption of Ernest Neufert is that there is nothing needed from us. We have to create an environment where you know you get inside the building without lowering your body without any kind it's it's an attempt to exclude any effort any 
any uh, you know uh, yes uh, accommodation accommod I no no uh, it, it's this idea that architecture should serve us completely comfortably and we don't have to make any kind of adjustment with our life or with our body or with who we are in order to use that, that, that building. But I think an interplay, an interaction between the building and the, and the human body and the human life is, uh, should be both ways. I mean, it's okay, I think, sometimes, and, 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 the, and Switzerland uh, in the pavilion, I think in 2016 uh, or 2018, uh, at the Venice Biennial, uh, well, rather directly comment, commented on this, where they changed the dimensions that, that we take for granted. Always, you know, the, the height of a table should be 85 centimeters or something like this. The, the height uh, of, a, of a handle of a door should be, again, 90 centimeters or so. The width of a door, everything is standardized. Everything is the same. Why? Why? In order to, to make life extremely boring? Look at this. Could I use this stair? Of course I could. Although this will not pass the, you know, will get not the signatures to be built today because it doesn't have a parapet, because of, I don't know, all kinds of reasons to hear, you know, what you could fall from here, you could fall. Yes, you could fall also on the flat land. You could, you, you, so, you know, the paraphernalia of protection about which uh, Rempol has talked about, you know, uh, is uh, just that, the paraphernalia of protection. I think if we had less uh, regulations and less fear of this and that and this and that, which still paradoxically doesn't eliminate the prospect, the very real prospect of a major war, uh, you know, so, you know, what's the meaning? We, we, we are so careful uh, put, uh, to put a, a parapet uh, on both sides of a stair, but we are not afraid to start a war. Of course, you would say they are not the same people. Yes, yes, maybe they are not the same people, but uh, anyway, I love this building. I, I really do. I wish uh, uh, we could build again like this. But of course, to build like this again means you only build occasionally and uh, you don't invest so much in all kinds of you know, functions, which are, I'm not so sure they are so essential to, to life. I don't think they are actually. Am I a fundamentalist? Maybe I am, but I love stone. I do love stone and I love this building. Is uh, you know uh, La Chapelle not not Dame du Haut uh, Tronchon better or worse than this building? No, it's not worse. Is it better? I don't know. I don't know. Is the sunset uh, here worse than the one at Tronchon? I don't think so. It's the same sunset. Uh, Okay, I'm becoming too nostalgic. Let's go quickly to Jackson Pollock to bring some vivacity into, into this evening. But the stone is still uh, very, very seductive. I, I think we can trust stone. I really do. If we can trust anything in this world is the stone. Okay, so this was about Charmani. And now let's go to um, uh, Jackson Pollock who was born on the 20th, 28th of, uh, of January. And let's talk a little bit about him, because while he was not an architect, I think he could have some uh, unexpected relevance to architecture. Uh, and I will try to say why. Uh, why would an abstract expressionist North American painter have relevance for architecture? And this is the question I will try to address today on the birthday of this very interesting and self-destructive painter. Let's read about him. Paul Jackson Pollock, 
born, as you can see, on, on January uh, 28th, 1912, so 110 years ago, was an American painter and a major figure in the abstract expressionist movement. He was widely noticed for his drip technique, a pouring of splashing liquid household paint onto a horizontal surface, enable, enabling him to view and paint his canvases from all angles. It was also called all over painting an action painting, since he covered the entire canvas and used the force of his whole body to paint, often in a frenetic dancing style. This extreme form of abstraction divided the critics. Some praised the immediacy of the creation, while others derided the random effects. In 2016, Pollock's painting titled number 17A was reported to have fetched, this is a word uh, loved by the media, it was sold for $200 million in a private purchase. Yes, of course, we have to mention uh, you know, purchasing prices because this is what uh, attracts us very much. You know, how much money a film makes at, at the box office and how much a painting is so-called fetching uh, at, the, at the sale. A, a re reclusive and volatile personality, Pollock struggled with alcoholism for most of his life. In 1945, he married the artist Lee Krasner, who became an important influence on his career and on his legacy. Pollock died at the age of 44, this meaning, this meaning in 1954, in an alcohol-related single car accident when he was driving. In December 1956, four months after his death, so I guess uh, he died in 56, um, uh, Pollock was given a memorial retrospective exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York City. A larger, more comprehensive exhibition of his work was held there in 1967. In 1998 and 1999, his work was honored with large-scale retrospective exhibitions at MoMA, meaning the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Tate Gallery in London. So this was the man when he was young. Uh, um, I think he was born in Iowa, uh, in the United States. And uh, here you don't uh, see yet that, um, distinctively uh, persistent anger uh, in the man, but you still see a certain level of uh, determination and maybe, uh, you know, considering his lips as, uh, you know, a considerable amount of sensuality. Uh, he, what is not mentioned, what was not mentioned in the short text I read is that he died together with other two ladies who were actually with him in, in the car when he drove through spring uh, fireplace in, uh, in uh, Long Island. And I know that place, I lived in the proximity of that place for two years. I was passing with a bus, um, his uh, own farm, essentially a farm. And uh, I visited the, the place where he painted. He died, he died on that road on which I was, uh, uh, using the bus uh, every day to go to a school I, I was working for. Uh, anyway, this was the, this was his uh, cottage, his, uh, you know, his place where he lived with Lee Krasner and he painted here um, by the time when they bought, I don't know, I don't know if they moved in after he began to have success and success came in big um, because, um, you know, uh, his paintings a lot, uh, attracted a lot of attention. It was him and uh, Mark Rothko, another great North American painter, but uh, he came from Russia, actually, Mark Rothko, who strangely both, in my opinion, the most brilliant painters of their time, and uh, both died tragically. Uh, Jackson Pollock died you know, in a car accident that probably he provoked being uh, under the influence of alcohol because he was an alcoholic and Mark Rothko committed suicide. 
and in a way both committed suicide. And I wondered why, because they had the way immensely successful. And yet at bottom, I guess they were very unhappy. Jackson Pollock's grave in the rear, in the, in the rear, we, you will see two graves actually. Jackson Pollock's and Lee Krasner's, his wife. Um, here they are. So this, this is the gravestone of uh, Jackson Pollock. And this is the one of Lee Krasner. Strange a little bit, the distance between them, considering that they were husband and wife. But compare the graves with the others here, you know, they, they, they are rather, you know, distinctive through their size and uh, not just the size, of course. Anyway, uh, now let's look at some of his paintings. He, his uh, so-called style that he became known for is, uh, is called, was called action painting. Uh, and I was wondering if it's not possible to do an action architecture. I do not have here examples of architecture done in that way, but if you are interested to see something of this sort, you can visit YouTube where I, I post uh, many of the presentations that I make on, on Zoom. And there is one called Scribbled Architecture. There you could see examples of attempts to use the same uh, kind of, let's call it strategy, to create an architecture spontaneously through uh, scribbling. And he was in a way doing some sort of violent uh, um, uh, pictorial scribbling. Like you see here, you know, he, of course, uh, this is against the, the you know, what, what might be called the normality of uh, controlled painting. But it was an expression of his personality, of his emotions, of his turbulence. It was a tormented form of painting, but it was not totally without some sort of uh, secret uh, ordering. Uh, these are not uh, as imbalanced as they might appear. No, I think, uh, I think there is an, an inner, an inner order in them, although, you know, the appearance is that there is not, but there is. Uh, and uh, and uh, I also have to say that I, I saw an exhibition with studies, I mean, earlier works of Jackson Pollock, this man who appear, apparently totally ignored figuration uh, and uh, the history of painting and so on, actually studied very, very carefully El Greco, for example. I actually think he was obsessed by God. I, I have seen studies and paintings derived from uh, contemplating the paintings of El Greco that are explicitly dealing with, with God. So in my opinion, any great artist, and I include here, alas, also uh, the architects, the best of them, I think, are uh, equally, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, impressed by the mystery of the world, by the mystery of creation, and uh, thus by God. And uh, I think even the most uh, apparently atheistic, or uh, uh, I don't know how to call him or her artist, uh, even, even that one, in my opinion, cannot be, it's because it's about the, 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 the cosmos, it's about the, 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 the infinity, it's about the mystery of life. You know, how could you be indifferent? I don't think it's possible, no. And Pollock, the, the abstract expressionist, was not. And you see what he did with the, you know, How is it called this kind of paint, you know, that you buy in, uh, it's not, uh, it's not paint for, made for artists, it's paint made for, you know, to paint walls and so on from the hardware store. Now, this is not Jackson Pollock. This is a restorer, you know, uh, who tries to take care of the, you know, the little, who knows, uh, drop fell or something. So you see, he's the specialist who try to, you know, uh, restore the painting, whose price is probably, you know, uh, 
over $100 million or something like this. Here is the Madman painting, you know. And uh, this kind of madness I knew myself. I also painted on the on the floor, and uh, I have to say it's 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 a good way of painting, you know. Even if you can step, if you can step, I don't know if he stepped on that. Yeah, he did. I guess I guess because it's not a framed canvas. It's just he rolled the canvas on the floor, and uh, and uh, painted uh, to death his emotions there. I think, in, in, you know, in this, uh, in this way, he was actually worshipping. This was his way of worshipping the unknown. Call it, call it God or call it some other way. The unknown. You know, uh, it, it was, I, I, this was indeed the original, uh, even raison d'etre of art, to worship to worship, to, 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 to pay homage, to celebrate, to, to, to sing, you call whatever you want to call it this action, the unknown, the, the mystery of creation, the sun, the trees, the grass, the birds, this incredible, incredible creation, because it is incredible. Well, what are we? You know, we are some human beings. We don't know where we came from. We don't know where we go. We don't quite know what we are doing here. In my opinion, we are the extraterrestrials. But if we look up, we see other planets, we see stars, we see my God, my God. And what we see is not everything. It's a very small part of, 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 of an immensity that we cannot even comprehend. So then, of course, Jackson Pollas is exploding here with colors in order to express his emotion. You know, and uh, look at him. You know, is a man possessed, but uh, a man possessed who um, left something behind. Unfortunately, yes, he died young. Now I'll show some early works, earlier works by him. The, the she wolf. So this abstract expressionist also assumed figuration. Like this, this, this painting is uh, is uh, has a level of. Uh, of a uh, figuration here. You see Jackson Pollock. Is it a good build, a good uh, painting? I think it is. He was also interested in, in mythology, not like an, uh, you know, an academic. No, not in that sense. He addressed myth through his stomach, through his emotions, as an artist should actually. You know, and but but this was not a man indifferent to spirit, no. But he was also not a man indifferent to blood. Yeah, there, there was a meeting between spirit and blood, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is needed in order to be serious about both. So what is thought to be a long lost Jackson Pollock painting, which was unearthed in an Arizona garage, is set to sell at auction for fifteen millions. Now you are going to see this. Someone have found in an Arizona garage this painting, uh, a long lost Jackson Pollock uh, painting. Uh, it's also true that uh, you know not all these uh, paintings or findings are genuine. You know, sometimes uh, you know you think it is genuine, or some specialist things, but they are not. Anyway, here he is again, smoking, drinking, painting. Smoking, drinking, painting, painting, drinking, smoking, drinking, smoking, painting. They went together. And women, of course, he loved women. He loved women even after he got married. Uh, in fact, he died with two women in his car. Uh, by that time, he was probably a millionaire and uh, success uh, killed him even quicker. But he was a good painter. And um, Possessed, of course. I mean, how else are you to leave something behind if you don't have, you know, some kind of a madness related to what the word possession uh, could mean? Look at him again here. He's dancing while painting, dancing. He's painting his guts out. He's, he's externalizing his demons. That's what he's doing. Yeah, I'm sure at uh, that time, if you offered him food or you would say uh, to him, you would have said to him, hey, Jackson, you don't want to sleep. You are not tired. He would have laughed at you. 
you know, sardonically, he would have said, shut up, you know, I need no food, I need no sleep, I need to take out my demons and look at the people staring at his painting, you know, and photographing him, uh, it and so on. This is what art does. Art is that beautiful, useless thing we cannot live without. <laughs> Is it useless? Apparently it is, but we cannot live without it. I know I can't, and I think many people really can. Although Adolf Law said that people love home and they hate art. Even the people who apparently hate art have on in their kitchens, on the wall, you know, an engraving, a beautiful etching of, uh, well, a copy, a print of Piranesi, for example, you know, um, it's uh, it's uh, it's a necessity the the uselessness or the useless art it really is even these scribblings of uh, Jackson Pollock they are they are uh, if someone pays two hundred million dollars in order to purchase one of these big paintings you can imagine so again if you want to see a kind of kind of an equivalent of the, this action painting of Jackson Pollock in architecture, please go to the YouTube uh, and uh, if you know the link, and if you don't, please ask him, ask me, and I will send it to you. And there is the uh, uh, recording, a uh, Zoom recording of a presentation called Scribbled Architecture. Here is another painting by Jackson Pollock. In a way, these people who contemplate the painting, they are complete contemplating themselves. It is very possible that actually a painting works better, a good painting, a genuine painting works better than a mirror. You know, they, they are probably staring at themselves by looking at the painting. El Greco influence on Jackson Pollock. I just told you about this, that this man knew about art history. This man was not just this savage who just painted on the floor with, uh, you know, hardware, uh, hard, uh, hard store, uh, how is it called? I forgot anyway, this kind of industrial painting. No, he knew. This is why I keep telling the, uh, the students and the architects and myself, we need to know, we need to know the history. We need to know the great painters if you are a painter, and you need to grow and you know the great architects if you are an architect, and you need to know the great painters if you are an architect too. You need, look at him. He, here is the painting by El Greco, and here is the study by Jackson Pollock looking. This is what, this is what the architect should do to learn to see and know the works of the great architects, study them, uh, even copy sometimes plans, sections, reflect on their works. That's how you learn. This is how Jackson Pollock learned how to paint. From whom? From El Greco. Is this a narrative painter? Yes, or painting? It is. Is it a you know, historical painting? Yes, it is. Uh, so this abstract expression is didn't just come out of the wild, you know, painting uh, in ways that uh, were not seen before. No. He was a student of the past, and we should be also students of the past if we don't want to just live for nothing. Here he is, uh, here he seems to be a little bit more happy. Uh, look at the studies from historical paintings. So he didn't arrive at the, the abstract expressionism out of the blue sky, no, no. We see the cross. Well, when you study El Greco, you cannot, uh, we see this man was, it's my opinion that through alcohol, through painting, through his excesses, he was actually trying to achieve a communion with the unknown, with the, with the, with the, with the ultimate un, un, unknown. We could call that ultimate un, uh, unknown God. Now you see, they, these are almost religious, religious they are these are religious these are you know uh, uh, 
pictorial or, or graphic representations of a man struggling with faith, actually. They are religious. Transformed also through, through, uh, through himself, through who he was, through his temperament. So his earlier paintings were kind of like this. Jackson Pollock, influences from Picasso as well, because of course Picasso influenced everybody. Although Picasso said that Cezanne was the father of them all, Cezanne, the modern painter. Um, this is, you know, we need painting, we need color, we need uh, painters, we need uh, art, we need art history, we need knowledge, we need love of art. You know, this is what should nourish the soul of the architect. I struggle every day to bring this to the fore because, in the absence of this, inspiration what are we left with you know it's very important pollock learn from el greco and other masters of the past we should also learn from many masters of the past in architecture and not only in architecture in poetry as well and painting and the other fields sculpture theology philosophy, literature. Uh, this pandemic is telling us stay home and study, learn, reflect, maybe transform this period into the age of introspection. Don't lose this time, it's precious. Every second is precious. Do something worth doing. And when the pandemic will go away, you can get out of the house and create in better ways. I don't know if uh, all of us do this now, but it's truly a time that can be used very usefully. This is what I think. So look at these studies, preliminary studies, so to speak, of, of Jackson Pollock. His painting was not born from nothing. There was nothing, there was something that nourished him. First, maybe the fire within. Yes, the fire within was maybe the main engine, but there was also the knowledge of the history of art, the painters he admired and studies. So, you know, he was part of a chain. He was on the spiral of time, not alone. Totems, he, 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 he painted also totems. Now, what is a totem? You know, it's, it's clearly a, an artifact that, that, um, that uh, is uh, religiously uh, charged or spiritually charged. His paintings, the, the early paintings are steps towards a more uh, subtle, but also more violent uh, expression of a quest that I wouldn't say failed. No, it didn't fail. You know, someone who was painting totems, you know, is, is, is someone who, uh, is aware of the great mystery of existence, of the great mystery of life, of, of spirit, of spiritual matters. Now you will say this man, sorry, sir, but this man had nothing spiritual about him. He loved alcohol. He was uh, excessive, abusive. He was abusing himself. He was betraying his wife and all the rest. You know, they, 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 you, know you cannot judge in this way. You know, it's, uh, he was tormented, that's for sure, a tormented man, but he was tormented perhaps exactly because he tried to make sense of his life, just like we all do, and uh, the only way he found uh, to, to express his angst was uh, through painting, through art, the key, 1946. You see, it's not, I began the presentation with his later works. This is not action painting. He arrived at action painting uh, after years spent, and not too many because he still died young, but uh, you know, he was painting, uh, you know, he was learning his way, his, his way into painting through various uh, attempts at, uh, you know, maybe inspired by, we saw inspiration coming from El Greco, there are some, some, you know, uh, there is some inspiration coming from Picasso. 
there are all kinds of because when you try to find your way that's why i keep saying you know you cannot ignore the history of architecture you cannot ignore the great creations in architecture you have to know them deeply and then try to transcend them in order to discover who you truly are but you need to you need that base you need that foundation and even a very personal, because obviously he was a, a very personal man, a, a painter with a strong personality, self-destructive, but very, very strong. And at the same time, very, very weak, you know, because the strongest materials actually are also the weakest. The head, you know, look ahead, we see some eyes here. Uh, uh, it's scared eyes and scaring eyes. He's staring at us. Uh, clearly, you know, uh, from a demonic, uh, you know, uh, self. La Quête Spirituelle, I found this wording relating to his painting uh, in French, you know, the, the spiritual quest of the painter Jackson Pollock. It's exactly what I was trying to evoke. This man was not at all indifferent to what we call spirit. Pollock, he present, let's see here, translate from French, uh, uh, presents uh, sim simili similitudes with the ritu rituals of pu purification, transformation and the renaissance accomplished by the shaman, the shaman, the medicine man in the so-called uh, primitive society. On fi we find symbols uh, in a constant fashion in all the work of the painter. So, in a way, this man born in Iowa, if I'm not mistaken, in mid-America, uh, in the Midwest, this man consciously and unconsciously, turbulently rediscovered the very first relationship that art had with religion. Art was a form of worship, and he was worshiping, actually. He was worshiping creation, God, the angels, the devil. He was worshiping. It was a highly spiritual activity in his painting. That's why who wrote this uh, text in French refers to the shaman. The shamanistic uh, uh, way of uh, you know, healing is based on an immersion on the mystery of creation that uh, modern medicine does not. Modern medicine is based on uh, chemistry, on uh, drugs, on analysis, on tests and tests and tests. That's why it's so expensive today to, to go to a doctor, you know, and we need insurance companies because everything is tested, measured in a lab and so on. Tests and tests and tests. The shaman didn't have tests. The shaman had intuitions, but, but that way of treatment uh, was was based on 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 uh, on uh, being immersed into into in, 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 into into the, the the mysterious forces that that agitate life and create life. You know, we read here purification, transformation, a rebirth. Uh, I I I don't know a lot. I know know very little about shamanistic uh, uh, culture. But I, I I think this text, this short text, is correct. Pollock was trying to heal himself through the art of painting. He was a shaman for himself. And many artists do the same thing. Van Gogh did the same thing. Van Gogh was also possessed, so-called possessed. Possessed by what? Possessed by, by his uh, wounds. You know, he was wounded. Pollock, Jackson Pollock was wounded too. We don't know. We don't know. His parents, his biography. His suffering, his, uh, his misgiving, his vulnerabilities, we don't know, but he transformed them. He transformed them through an ardent personality and activity, through passion. It's about passion. And that's why I'm so exasperated that I do not see passion in our students, and not only in our students. I don't see it. I don't know where it is. And without that passion, you cannot create anything. Not just art, you can create. Send ritual, ritual scene. Look at this, you know, why the word ritual? 
Well, because again, this man was worshiping through his painting. That's why he was worship, worshiping. Mask, mask again, look at this. There is some figuration there, maybe a little bit too sweet there, the center. But again, this man was immersed into, uh, you know, an incredible fight between himself and his own demons. Naked man with, with knife. Well, that knife he always had in his hand. He used it uh, convincingly painting, but he also used it in order to kill himself. Not with a knife per se, but in essence, still with a knife of alcohol, alcoholism. He was an angry man, a very angry man, but there is between, uh, between creation or creativity and anger, a close relationship. Uh, you, you cannot be placid at this level of intensity. No, no, you, no art can be created from a position of placidity. No, circumcision. Look at this. It's, it's, it, 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 he was living dramatically, actually. The moon woman cuts the circle. The moon woman. Well, the woman is the moon, mythologically speaking. She is the moon. This man, man, this man was addressing the moon woman within himself. The moon within himself. Uh, look at this. Sorry, uh, I thought that I had a, a different picture with it, but uh, this is it. The moon woman uh, cuts the circle. What did he mean by cutting the circle? You see, I would love to have architects who name the works kind of in the same way. Let's imagine an architect saying, this is, the, this is a project of the moon woman or for the moon woman cutting the circle. Can we, can we do projects in this way? Can we conceive a building in this way? Let's say now after this presentation, I go to my drafting board or whatever, I go on the floor on my knees, take some paper, take some colors, take some pencil, take whatever, and make a house, make the plans or whatever, the drawings of a house for the moon woman who cuts the circle. This is inconceivable for us because we are trained in such a dry rationalistic way that we cannot conceive of doing a house for the moon woman who cuts the circle. We don't even understand the language. What does he mean, cuts the circle? What does he mean, the moon woman? This language is too, you know, uh, shadowy and dark and, uh, you know, it's almost pathological for us. For us being so divorced from the sources of life. That's why our architecture is so banal. That's why. And that's why the painter screams because he screams of course he screams because we don't scream with our stupid, ridiculous, flat white walls that we are not tired of. Then the painter drinks a bottle of whatever and paints madly in protest. He protests against us, actually, not just against himself. It's a protest, of course, turbulence. I don't know if you know, but uh, um, uh, Mark Wigley, who was the dean at Columbia University after Bernard Chumi for about 15 years, he wrote a manifesto towards turbulence. Unfortunately, that manifesto disappeared from the web. I used to find it, but now we, I cannot find it any longer. This was the dean of a prestigious architecture school in New York City, who invited his students to work towards turbulence. In essence, he invited them to work towards Jackson Pollock, to express emotions, to work for the moon woman who cuts the circle. Are we doing something similar? No, no, and no again, because we are timid. We are timid and we, we are afraid of truth our own truth. This man died young at 40 something, but he left something behind. You know, here he is, I think he's, I'm not sure if this is Lee Kressner, 
now, now, this is not Lee Kresner. This is a lady who admired his painting and, uh, you know, obviously a rich lady with those two. She was probably as alone and uh, miserable as the painter was, if not more so, you know, uh, with uh, those two dogs. I mean, how much could comfort those two dogs, an unhappy, a beautiful woman otherwise and rich and all the rest, but deep down still very unhappy. And she needed the painter, she needed him to, to paint her own drama, her own turbulence, her own inner turbulence. At least she had the wisdom and the vision to understand that he was a great painter, and he was. We need such strong examples to inspire us, to stir us up, to make us break the box, because we are within the box, the cage. Here he is. <laughs> Maybe posing a little bit, maybe tormented, you know, uh, maybe he was contemplating his early death. Who knows? But again, he left something behind him. And what he left is actually his soul expressed in a pictorial way. The five most iconic paintings by Jackson Pollock. Let's look at them. Here he is. That is uh, Lee Krasner, his wife. And here is her tormented uh, husband. She didn't paint in this way like he did. Uh, she, but she still was a good painter. Lee Krasner, on, in her own way, she was a good painter. Not so you know, diabolical as Jackson, but uh, a good painter. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, he was, of course, possessed, possessed by the... In fact, it wasn't him who painted. No, he was just the hand, but the force that manifested itself through his, uh, through his whole body and his soul and his mind and his hand was not him, actually. Was, who knows? Who knows how to call it? We don't know. The she-wolf, we saw it, the she-wolf, the mural, uh, mural, we saw it probably, but without its title, Lavender Mist. Uh, and mist it is, it is misty. You know, this man who uh, attacked the demons that attacked him, his inner demons, was actually uh, searching for purity and probably for peace. A peace he didn't find, perhaps until he died, tragically as he died. Number five. This is the painting number five. Do we need painting? Of course we do. Do we need color? Of course we do. Do we need the expression of emotions? Of course we do. Why? Because most of the time we, we, we use neither. We are, when will architecture again be vital and vitalistic and emotional and symbolically charged? And uh, as I said, make a house for the she moon or for the moon woman who cuts the circle. Let's make, I will try to make one myself. In 1951, Jackson Pollock said, it seems to me that the modern painter cannot express his age. The airplane, the atom bomb, the radio, in the old forms of the Renaissance or any other past culture, each age finds its own technique. He's right, of course, what he says and not very, you know, in a very perhaps uh, appealing or interesting way, all artists thought and felt on the facade of the secessionist building in Vienna. Maria Olbrich said the same thing in German, you know, to each age its art and to art its freedom. So we cannot build today like we would have built or built 100 years ago and certainly not like one 600 years ago or 500 years ago. No, no, we can't. But at the same time, we cannot ignore what was built then. You have to absorb, as Friedrich Nietzsche said, pour everything into the mold. In other words, do not, do not neglect anything, absorb everything, but express your time and place, your age accurately in your work here now. Convergence. That's how this uh, painting is called, Convergence, believe it or not. But I do see Convergence here. 
between opposing forces. Actually, I find this, this painting very harmonious. Sorry for, uh, you know, perplexing you. Uh, there is a website, you know, Jackson Pollock uh, organization where you can see many other works by him because this man, although he lived, uh, he, he died young, rather young, uh, not as young as uh, Vincent van Gogh, but still young, uh, um, left many works behind him. interesting the you know the dynamic uh, you know, uh, movement of that lady you know in front of this uh, you know uh, building but she still looks it seems a little bit it gives it a glance or something uh, here they are measuring measuring because these paintings uh, as you imagine are you know uh, great investments, you know, bankers and so on, all kinds of very rich people would, would, would give their lives and their, uh, you know, uh, appreciable uh, savings to have one of these paintings. Um, now, what we look at here, can we create a, uh, an architecture in this way? Now, of course, architecture is different from painting. But there are still very important architects today who actually start a project kind of in this way, like Massimiliano Fuxas, or, uh, well, he died a few years ago, Will Alsop, and others too. Even uh, Wolf Prix and his former partner, they began a project by closing their eyes and exploding with lines on paper. And then after a while, they opened their eyes and they looked at the um, scribbling, uh, at, uh, and then they try to make sense of those, you know, uh, lines, and that's how some some constructions, some buildings were born. And when I asked Paul Prix, and I said this before, what do you recommend, young architects or students, and so on? He said, "Don't think." How? What kind of architecture would you do? If you don't think, but I think what I think what Wolf Prix thought meant was that even when you don't apparently you don't think you actually think, and you think in a deeper way. You think with your hand. You think with your heart. You think with your plexus, uh, solar plexus. You think with your whole being, not just with the brain. I think if you want it to be more um, uh, accurate or descriptive, he could have said, don't think just with the brain. And unfortunately, a lot of ar the architect's activity is based on the workings of the brain. But, but the whole being is not just the brain. No, not at all. That's why Blaise Pascal said the heart has its reasons which the reason or the mind does not know. Are we listening to the heart? Are we listening to the solar plexus? Because the so-called primitive man, I read about the shaman, they believe that the center of the human being was in the solar plexus, not in the heart and not in the brain. It might even be in the legs or in the souls or in the hands. So are we, implicating our whole being in the process of conceiving a building? Most of the time, no, we do not. So I wonder, let's say we take this painting or this image from Jackson Pollock and try to make an architecture from it. What kind of architecture would it be? Would it be with some placid rectangles? Maybe as a, as a contrast, you know, harmony through contrast, but it could also be something very different. So, you know, the, the important thing is to be honest and to, to express what you feel and think as intensely as possible. And to start, yes, from life, as even Miss van der Rohe said, you have to start from life, not from a dogma, not from the prescriptions of a certain program and so on. No, from life. And life many times 
is much larger, if not all the time, much larger and much more complex and much deeper and much more emotional and disturbing even than any program of uh, any so-called, uh, you know, theme for building anything. Uh, coming, going back to Volprix, he even said, me and my partner, we never read the program of a, of a, of a building. We don't read it at all. And it actually works. It does work. You make a building without reading the program and you'll see that, surprise, surprise, those who are to evaluate it might even like it. I know it is so. So make a building starting from exactly what you look at here. You will see such buildings on uh, scribbled architecture on that YouTube uh, channel that I mentioned. I like this work very much. He actually, this is from his last period. You know, he, he probably was approaching some kind of a dead end street because you know, he probably exhausted his, uh, his way of painting. And uh, yes, his last works are like this, devoid of color and just splashes of black blackness as we look here. We see here some kind of a diabolical dance of the, of, of, you know, of, of his inner demons. That's what we look at. Does the architect have inner demons? Of course he does or she does. We all do as long as we are, we are on this earth. We all do. We are not just angelic uh, rationalists. We are not. So again, these works are from his very, this, this is last work, his last work. He, 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 you know, it's kind of interesting. This man, this man, in my opinion, was honest. He was representing, we saw his studies with El Greco, uh, of, of El Greco and uh, all those uh, paintings immersed in the, you know, mythology, in shamanistic culture, totems uh, and so on. And he arrived here where, he was probably approaching uh, some kind of an exasperation and of an exhaustion. I also remember that uh, Kazimir Malevich, the great suprematist painter and the constructivist, he uh, painted uh, abstractions, a black square on a black background. Uh, but in his later years, he returned to figurative painting, you know, pe peasant Russian women, uh, abstracted a little bit, but still figurative painting. I wonder where Jackson Pollock would have arrived at if he lived another 30 or 40 years. You know, who knows? Maybe he would have returned to El Greco or to some kind of a, maybe because he had an ardent personality. This man was burning. And it's possible he would have returned in a, on the spiral of his own time and his own biography to uh, worshiping uh, the unknown forces of, of life and nature and inner nature in, in who knows what way. This, these are some of his last works. And uh, it shows, they show in my opinion, uh, great uh, turmoil. This was a dark man. But it doesn't mean that this dark man did, was not searching for light. I think he was. And maybe the poet, Nikita Stanescu, was right, right. Darkening darkness, thus the gates of light. I don't know who this gentleman is here, but I think they, uh, yes, it's uh, Lee Kressner with uh, Pollock uh, in the middle. And uh, I don't know who he is. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They, they look at the, you know what I would love? I would love to have architects. Of course, we have pan the pandemic now, but we can still meet on Zoom, uh, even from a distance. I would love architects and students to come together to show each other's works but works which address the moon woman cutting the circle. In other words, works which are not, uh, you know, commissioned by anyone, school or clients or whatever, but are born from an inner necessity to express oneself architecturally as creatively as possible. 
Yes, let's imagine there are here three architects and one of them created these works. Let's imagine the, the architectural projects. And uh, he shows them to the others. Look at the hands of the painter. They almost pray these hands. They are. Neither Lee Krasner nor this gentleman have their hands. They almost remind me of Louis Kahn in a picture with his hands, kind of like Jackson Pollock's hands. This man was searching for God in his paintings, even if his paintings appear to be diabolical or whatever. He was, in my opinion, searching for God, just as Kazimir Malevich was searching for God through his square, black squares. I find these artists very inspirational because they, they show us a desire for truth, the inner truth. Here she is with uh, Lee Krasner. Here he is after he made it to the Time uh, magazine uh, uh, cover, uh, as, uh, you know, because he became a phenomenon and. Uh, you know, uh, it was very talked about. You can see the appearance of the tie on the white shirt, but you can tell that this man is still a volcano and the man possessed. How many architects today where we are are so-called possessed? Composition with masked forms by Jackson Pollock is a, nine, a 1941 oil on canvas. Maybe I should prepare a presentation about architecture and possession or self-possession. What are we going to do in order to bring this kind of ardent passion into architecture? Of course, architecture is, has its own specificities and art has its, uh, I mean, it, there are distinctions, of course, but they are both arts and you cannot do great architecture without ardor, in my opinion. You have to have ardor, otherwise you end up in banality. Going West, 1934, look at this painting, an early painting, very early, figurative also. But we see here the moon on the sky. Is she the moon woman? Maybe. Uh, it's a good painting, this one, I think. This man, again, he was not just throwing colors decoratively. This man was, was, was uh, trying to legitimize his life. He was earning his life through his great effort because it was a great effort, red, black, and silver. He did many works. You know, ocean grayness. Is it a grayness? Yes, the ocean is gray, but what is on the ocean or in the ocean? Uh, we see things which are not gray. The final days of Jackson Pollock. Uh, I didn't know this painting. I know that he painted in his last days, uh, in, in, last in the last period of his life, those black and white uh, paintings. Those were his last, uh, that was the last serious in his uh, in his over here he is here he was continuously smoking continuously uh, with a cig cigarette in in his mouth and you can tell from the expression of his face and from for those um, lines on his forehead that this man was not a superficial man he was a man who didn't play games with life he took it seriously and he died because of it Painting is self-discovery. This is what he said. And I totally agree. Painting is self-discovery. But I add to this, equally, architecture should be self-discovery. And are we uh, perceiving or interpreting architecture as being self-discovery? And if we are not, why not? I truly believe he was right. Painting is self-discovery. Equally, I would say architecture is self-discovery. And if it is not a process of self-discovery, then in my opinion, we are not honoring architecture sufficiently. 
Now, architecture should be like a self-portrait, a building and in fact, you know, contemplating the works of so many architects, I discovered sometimes I actually saw even the head, the, the figure, the portrait of, a, of, of the author into the building. Of course, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I, you know, an interpretation in my imagination, but it is in as much as you see in a, in a, in a good writing, you see the writer. The, it should be the same in architecture to see in a building its creator. But unfortunately, the great majority of buildings do not tell us anything about the, uh, their creators. And in, in this sense, they are fail, failures. A building should be a self-discovery. A painting should be a self-discovery. And we can learn from the painters something that we forgot, in my opinion. And this is, I think, the last image of this uh, uh, small homage to Jackson Pollock. Uh, you know, a fragment of uh, of a table, uh, his table with a few tubes. What did he leave behind? He left behind his uh, process, his journey towards self-discovery through his paintings. So let's let's wish him happy birthday, and let's not forget to reflect on what he taught us. Thank you.